Good morning. Welcome, friends, to this edition of our live Q&A with Dear Pandemic. I'm Dr. Malia Jones from Dear Pandemic, and I'm joined this morning with, by Dr. Jennifer Dowd. Actually, it's afternoon for you, Dr. Dowd. Um, and we're going to be tackling questions from our readers about COVID, vaccines, and much more. And um, I'm really excited to announce that today we have some live closed captioning, as well as live American Sign Language interpretation provided by Bridges for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing of Tennessee. So I wanna thank Bridges very much for providing these services to get our word out to a wider audience. Um, Lucinda Plexico is providing our live closed captioning and we are joined by Jeannie Settlemeyer who's doing ASL interpretation. So welcome to both of you as well. Dr. Dowd, how are you this morning? I'm doing all right. It's afternoon over here in the UK and um... I guess it's good news, bad news over here. We're, we're getting vaccines out relatively quickly, but our, our deaths are still quite high. Um, so hoping that we'll turn the corner soon. It's starting to look better, but um, we're all in lockdown. So yeah, it's, it's all right. Um, but how are things going in, in Wisconsin? I heard there's something about mink farmers getting their vaccinations. Yeah, we just um, this week have, uh, have been, debating who's going to be in the next vaccine priority group, group 1B. And we got a couple of questions actually about this recommendation that people who are involved in mink husbandry are going to be in phase 1B, which is something that, I mean, I never expected to learn so much about mink. Um, but as it turns out, this is an important industry in the state of Wisconsin. And um, mink are very susceptible to COVID-19. So it's really important that we it's actually the committee considered it a, a um, super high priority biosecurity risk to make sure that the mink living in Wisconsin are not infected with COVID-19 from their handlers, so. Okay, so the idea is they would catch it from the farmers would be the danger, yeah. We wanna make sure that, so the mink themselves are very susceptible and can pass it around, around really readily and that animal human transmission back and forth is very high risk for mutations in the virus. And so we want to make sure that that is not happening by getting the people, who, the humans who deal with the mink um, vaccinated and make sure they don't, don't give COVID to the mink. Okay. That sounds reasonable then. I wonder how many there are in Wisconsin. There are about 300 humans who yes. handle mink professionally. Um, there are many millions of mink, as it turns out. Yeah. And I just learned this morning that um, there's also some uh, work in the veterinary pharmaceutical industry to develop a vaccine for mink. So um, hopefully That's that'll help protect the mink population. But our cats and dogs are okay, right? The cats and dogs, it does not seem to be as readily transmitted from cats and dogs to people. In fact, I think we've still seen no cases of that happening. They can catch COVID, but they seem to do pretty well when they get it. Mink do not. Mink get very sick and die of it very readily. All right, fun facts. Fun facts, who knew? So we have a couple of special notes um, to get started with today. So first of all, I, I again, I wanna, offer a huge thank you to Bridges for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for providing our closed captioning and ASL interpretation. And we're gonna be providing this service. Um, Bridges will be providing it for us through the end of February. And we would love to know if you are using it. So if you are um, someone who needs the closed captioning or the ASL interpretation, please let us know in the comments or by sending us an email. Um, so thanks Bridges for that. Also, I wanna mention that uh, we have a follower survey open right now and it is closing on Monday. So this is your last chance if you haven't already filled out the Dear Pandemic follower survey, we're doing a study of who our followers are and, um, and how they use Dear Pandemic. And we're gonna be publishing this in a scientific journal and contributing to the science of, of the pandemic this way. So we'll drop a link to the study in the um, comment box right now. Yeah, that's exciting. Real data from our real followers. Yeah. Yeah. Excited to see that. Uh, I am I too. Wanted to mention that we have a new newsletter um, at Dear Pandemic. Um, so if you're doing a social media fast or something, but still want to be able to see our posts, um, we send out now 
a twice weekly newsletter that has some highlights of the most popular posts. Um, and you can sign up on our website to give um, your email there. It should be at the top of dearpandemic.org. Um, and you know we will not um, harass you or send you uh, more than those emails or, or sell your email. Um, so it's, it's safe with us, but we wanted another way uh, to reach people directly because Facebook um, doesn't always um, show our posts to everyone. So please sign up if you're, if you're interested in that. And I also, sorry, also then wanted to mention about our question box on the website. Um, just a reminder that in our Q&A, we don't take uh, live questions. We don't take them cold because we are kind of data nerds. We like to really do our research and make sure that we're giving you the best information. So kind of, we are totally like, data nerds. Yeah, really, <laughs> we're nerds. Um, so we would be really nervous about taking them to on the spot and, and wouldn't want to give you um, any information. So we do a lot of research to make sure we're getting the right facts to you. So please go to dearpandemic.org and put your question in our question box. And just to say, we read each and every one of those. Um, it does inform what we talk about in the Q and A's and also the posts that we write each week. So please go ahead and put your questions there. Yep, I read them all this week. We got over 120 questions, many of them still about vaccines. So we are gonna be talking about vaccines some more today. I get to ask you the first one, Jen. We have a question from Philip from Austria. And Philip asks us, um, there are currently 29 time-related deaths to the, uh, to the vaccine in Norway. Is there any more data available of the circumstances is this a concern in terms of vaccine safety in elderly people, or is it maybe just the normal mortality of elderly people with severe health conditions? Okay, great question, Philip. Um, and a shout out to our European followers. Thank you. Um, and this is a, a question that I've been kind of worried about since the beginning of the vaccine rollout. So I'm really glad that we get an opportunity to talk about this. Um, so what happened in Norway, um, was you know, not surprisingly something that started on social media that got mentioned that in this case, 23 um, deaths happened amongst about 42,000 people getting the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Um, and in Norway, the prioritization started with residents of nursing homes. So this was starting in the most frail and, and elderly population. Um, and so the 23 deaths- can yeah. I just interrupt you? When we say time related, that means that someone died within, you know, shortly after they got the vaccine. That's what shortly time after, related right. means. Right. And so I don't know exactly, um, you know, how, how long. I'm, I'm assuming it was within days um, for these particular deaths, but all of these deaths were in people 75 um, years of age or older. And a lot of them, you know, were amongst the most frail um, in these nursing homes or terminally ill. So all these deaths are individually under review to kind of look at exactly what the underlying cause of death was. Um, but looking at them more collectively, um, scientists as well as other regulatory boards have been um, taking a look at all you know, deaths that happen within a short time after vaccination. And the WHO uh, Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety has already come out and said that the fatalities are in line with what we would expect from all cause mortality rates in this population of frail elderly individuals. Um, and so what does that mean exactly? Um, you know, we know that sadly people who are over age 80, especially those frail enough to be in a nursing home have what we call a high baseline, you know, level of mortality. And by baseline, we mean, you know, what would we expect to see if the world was just chugging along without COVID, without new vaccines, um, and in this case, we know that around 400 deaths typically occur in one week in Norway in nursing homes. Um, and so that means that, you know, these deaths might not have been, um, you know, particularly unusual, especially in this population. And so I actually did some, you know, additional back of the envelope math um, as nerdy girls like to do. And so actually, if you're over 80, um, on average, there's about a one in 500 chance that you would die in a given week. So, you know, it's relatively small, 0.2%. Um, but still, if you multiply that by 42,000, um, you know, vaccinations, you might expect, you know, in a week about 80 deaths to happen in that population. Um, and this was amongst the most frail, not even an average 80-year-old. Right. So, 
Um, that's the type of analysis that gives us confidence that there's nothing unexpected uh, really going on due to the vaccination. Right. Um, so, yeah, this came up lat, um, here in the States, too. Um, yeah. I posted about this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, people die all the time, unfortunately, of all kinds of things, some of them expected, some of them not. And yeah, we have to look at that, that baseline trend before we... Um, you know, that's what I really wanted to get on my soapbox about was that, you know, we know that lots of things happen um, after we're vaccinated, you know, and most of those things would have happened anyway. And that's what's so challenging about communicating um, the news about these types of events, um, you know, because humans look for patterns and meaning. Um, and especially if something good or bad happens to you, you know, you want to ascribe that to some sort of um, mechanism. Um, but I'm sure there's lots of people actually, you know, who might go out and, and buy a winning lottery ticket after they get vaccinated, um, but they might also get hit by a car. And, you know, one of my favorite examples of this type of coincidence was from the actual Moderna study um, where they published, you know, they had to really investigate any adverse event that happened in the trial to any participant. And there was someone who had um, a heart arrhythmia within 28 days of receiving the Moderna vaccine, um, but it actually was due to being struck by lightning. Um, and this was published in the Moderna results. I know, and to me that was, you know, I'm glad that they investigated that and, and figured out that it was not vaccine associated, but it's a great example of, um, you know, how there's just a lot of things that happen. And now that we're giving millions and millions of doses, um, you know, each week. So the US wants to give a million doses a day um, right. And, you know, that just means that there's going to be heart attacks and strokes that would have happened anyway. Um, and it's important for us to step back and look at the data and say, are we seeing anything more than we would have expected? Um, and the case, you know, right now with millions and millions of doses, we really are seeing a great safety profile. Um, and so, you know, we really just need to anticipate some of these media stories that, you know, when something bad happens, that's going to get circulated in social media. Um, and then, you know, in news outlets, it's really tempting to, to think that's directly related to the vaccine. Um, but I, we can guarantee that all of these events are being investigated closely. Um, and the nerdy girls will, will look at the data. And if there ever is something that looks concerning, we'll be the first to let you know. But it's actually yeah. looking really, really good from a safety standpoint right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting because you have posted many times about the related some some uh, math that's similar to this, which is, you know, we also look at the mortality data and um, look at whether deaths overall have increased in the presence of COVID. Yeah, it's a really related um, concept because, you know, we're also saying we're saying a lot of 80 year olds die anyway, right? Um, right. On a daily basis in the absence of COVID. So people might say, well, you know, then how do we know that these COVID deaths that we're attributing to all the over 80s are actually due to COVID? And so exactly what you said, we actually look at how many deaths do we expect, you know, based on previous years, um, kind of a general average, and we can then see how many deaths there have been above and beyond that. And that's really right. the best evidence we have that these deaths are happening at a really high rate, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Can I ask you a, a question? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, we have a question from Kathy from Wisconsin. Um, that's a really great question um, about the vaccine. Kathy says, I got my first Pfizer shot yesterday and have oh, an appointment. Yeah. yeah, yay. And have an appointment in three weeks for the second one. That we're jealous of that here in the UK, I must say, the second dose appointments. I recall the 95% reduction headlines about the study results. Am I correct that that meant 95% fewer symptomatic cases in the group that got the vaccine? Also, did I hear that there were no serious cases in the vaccine group? What did that mean? No hospitalizations, no intubations. And when after the vaccine um, is that protection thought to kick in? I'm looking forward to resuming in-person, but masked and six foot distance social activities. Yes. Yeah. Great question, Kathy. So I, this is a great opportunity for me to do a quick review of how the trials work. 
and and what we learned from them. So so the way these vaccine um, efficacy trial, the the big trial that precedes them um, applying for FDA approval, the way they work is they enroll tens of thousands of people. Pfizer enrolled about thirty thousand people. Um, in this case, 45% of those people were over the age of 65 and 30% were people of color. So we had a really nice representation of some important demographics um, to get some good information about safety and efficacy across those, those groups. Um, once people are enrolled, they randomly assign the participants to get one of two shots. One is a vaccine. Um, or a shot, and then one is a shot with no active ingredients at all called a placebo. Both groups get a first dose and a second dose on a schedule. In this case, it's three weeks apart. Um, and the participants don't know, and actually neither do the people giving the shots, which groups they're in. Uh, so you don't know when you're in the, in the trial, whether you're in the, the active ingredient, the vaccine group, um, sometimes called the treatment group or the placebo. So then what happens? They wait. They ask the participants in both groups to um, continue social distancing, wearing masks and so on, and report any symptoms. They check in with them at least once a week and ask if they have any COVID-19 symptoms. If they do, they were tested for COVID. Um, and then once overall, and so they get confirmed if they have COVID um, with a PCR test. Once the study in across both groups it gets to a predetermined number of cases, then the people running the study can look and see is the vaccine group doing better than the placebo group, right? In this case, they ended up with 170 cases of COVID across those 30,000 participants across both groups. Um, and you're right, what they found was actually an, a spectacularly big difference between the placebo group and the vaccine group. There were 95% fewer symptomatic cases in the in the vaccine group. Um, specifically, there were 170 confirmed cases overall, and there were 162 of them in the placebo group and just eight in the vaccine group. Can I just say again how that's such an amazing result? We never would have expected that. <laughs> it's, it's like spectacular. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the mRNA, the promise of mRNA vaccines has been out there for a long time, but um, it really is amazing to have a vaccine with that kind of efficacy. More good news, there were not major differences by age or gender or other demographics in terms of who was most likely to get, um, to get COVID in the vaccine group. There was actually one severe case in the vaccine group. There were nine severe cases in the placebo group for the Pfizer trial. I think probably Kathy is thinking about the um, Moderna trial that had no severe cases. And in this case, severe means uh, hospitalization or death. So um, the last question was, when does the efficacy kick in? We think it probably kind of curves up over time and then is most boosted after the second dose. But in the study, the efficacy is measured seven days after the second dose. So it's actually like a cutoff the way the study is designed. So um, it's 28 days after the first dose and seven days after the second dose is when that 95%, when we reach the 95% efficacy estimate. And then the other thing I would just wanna mention here, cause we got a couple of other questions related to this. Um, side effects were actually very uncommon, especially severe side effects. And the only side effect that was reported in a majority of people was pain at the injection site. 82% um, had, had either mild or moderate pain at the injection site, but um, the vast majority of people had, had no fever, um, no body aches, no headache, none of these other symptoms that, that we've been warning people about, including after the second dose. Yeah, so, and the, the link I'm gonna drop is just, you know, there's a lot out there about these study results, but I think they're a little dry. And I found this great story about a person who was a participant in the trial that I thought was really cool and just talks about what it was like to be in the trial, why he volunteered and so on. So that's the link that we're gonna put in the comments here. You can read about one of the trial participants. That's great. And yeah, and I'll just say that that protection against severe disease is, is also so important. Um, I think we'd all agree if you if you test positive um, and have some symptoms that 
you know, that's, that's concerning, but it's going to be amazing if we can prevent the most serious cases, which it seems to be really good evidence in all these trials. Yeah. And I'm going to return to this idea about um, the risk for different age groups too. So we'll talk about that in a second. But first, I want to remind everyone, um, we don't take questions live during these sessions. If you have a question, you should go to our website and put it in our question box. It's dearpandemic.org and the question box is right at the bottom. You can also search for an answer to your question on there. Um, so our next question I get to ask you, Jen, Tova from Madison, Wisconsin. To I know Tova. Hi, Tova. Hi, Tova. I know Tova. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got a similar question from Liz from Boston and Jamie from Philadelphia. And the question is, is there any reason to think that greater transmissibility of the new variants of COVID-19 has anything to do with fomite transmission? Um, have we, do we have to reassess the importance of wiping down our groceries due to the, sh the emergence of the new variants? How do we behave differently? Okay, yeah, this is a great question. And we'll, we'll start by redefining fomites, which I think was a, um, you know, a word that we all learned for the first time last March, at least most of us. And that refers to really surface transmission that um, you know, particles that would survive on surfaces. And, you know, we were very worried about wiping down all sorts of things at the very beginning of the pandemic. So, so the question is, are these, you know, new variants, um, have they become smarter in some way um, that we need to change our, our tactics about, you know, preventing transmission? And, you know, I think, um, you know, the thing that we are learning, first of all, I'll reiterate that, you know, these new variants sound quite scary and, and we're doing a lot of research to figure out what's going on with them. But it's still true that these viruses mutate very regularly, that that's a very natural thing. Um, and so it's, it's not necessarily dangerous in and of itself. Um, so every time you hear about a new mutation, you don't need to, to get, you know, super stressed about it. Um, but these recent ones from the UK and South Africa have acquired several more mutations than you might expect within that period of time. Um, and of course, the one in the UK is thought to perhaps be more transmissible based on how quickly it spread throughout the UK, but it's, there's still investigations about that to understand why that might be the case. Um, but the, the biggest hypothesis right now um, for why it, it might potentially be more transmissible really has to do with the ease um, with which the virus might be able to enter your cells, that there's been some changes to the spike protein that might make it a little easier to infect and latch on to your cells. Um, there's been some evidence of higher viral load than in the nose and throat of people infected with this variant, although again, there's some conflicting evidence on that. Um, but all of this type of evidence suggests that if this is more transmissible, it's likely working through some mechanism where it might be slightly easier for you to get infected, maybe with a lower dose um, because it can enter your cells more easily, or an infected person might be producing on average a bit more virus that they're shedding out into their environment. Um, so that's you know, what we think is happening, but there's a lot of research ongoing. But the good news is, is that there's no evidence that these changes, you know, would defy the laws of physics and allow the virus to suddenly get through walls or get through masks that are physical barriers. Um, and soap and water will still dissolve that lipid membrane of the virus. It's very effective defense at that. Um, so it has not become a super mutant or anything, you know, no superpowers in that regard. Um, and so what we really need to do is just double down on um, the prevention tactics that we already know about, which is really, I think, sharing air um, or swapping air, as Mike Osterholm likes to say. We need to stop swapping air. Um, and I would think that, you know, practically the thing that might um, increase the risk of transmission from this new variant is you spending maybe slightly more time in close proximity with someone who's infectious. If they're expelling you know, more virus out of their breath, um, there might be a lot, you know, less safe amount of time that you could spend talking to them. So we used to say 15 minutes for close contact, it might be that that duration gets shortened. Um, but the basic principles of distance and masking and ventilation, all of those things are gonna work just as well on this new variant. Um, so do more of the same and just be more vigilant, but um, the groceries and lettuce I think are still, you know, should not be the focus of our, of our obsessions. Right. Yeah. It hasn't developed a, you know, new 
like fundamentally new way of transmitting. It doesn't, um, it's not waterborne all of a sudden, right? It right. still appears to be. Yeah, no reason to believe it lasts longer on surfaces that, you know, we would be able to see some changes like that, but there's no evidence of that. Yeah, and we'll definitely be continuing to, to watch this issue carefully. I'm, I'm very worried about it in the U.S. Um, and so I'm, I'm paying attention to it. What do you think about these, these um, suggestions that we should boost our, our mask practices, you know, wearing two masks or wearing one of the disposable, like the uh, KN94 masks that are, I don't know if they're readily available where you are, but they are here. Yeah, I think that we're going to probably post on that this week because there has been some news yeah. out about double masking. Um, you know, I think that we're acknowledging that, we, you know, we still have many months where prevention and reducing transmission through these other interventions is going to be really important. So I think you know, that maybe the cloth masks were a good, um, you know, way to manage in those early months, but, you know, it, there's probably evidence on what's the most effective. And um, I think we're going to, yeah, try to get the scoop on that and post something this week. Yeah, I am, I myself am, am wearing a KN94 mask around when I'm out That's and about. That's my favorite. Yeah, if I feel like I'm you know, and yeah, going to be in contact with any people. That's that's my yeah. go-to. There was a new study this week that showed that um, that tested a single layer cloth mask versus a double layer cloth mask, and there was a clear difference in those two. The double layer was better, so um, that was actually just validation of what we already kind of recommended. But yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, but I think yeah, there's you know even that's going to be a big focus now. I think of the new administration also planning to look at all sorts of PPE recommendations, yeah. and get stuff into people's hands, so hopefully. Okay, yeah. we have one question left and we're almost out of time. Let's get to it. I know, sorry, I knew our nerdy uh, talk would go on too long, um, but I'd like you to, yeah, weigh in on Vicki's question from Florida. Vicki asks, should I get the vaccine for my very healthy 86 year old mom who lives with us? A year of quarantine has just been too much. Are there any studies on side effects for this age? Yeah, so great news, Vicki. I am going to say um, an unqualified yes. You should get her the vaccine. The vaccine safety data, as we were just talking about, look still look terrific. And I'll, I'll just reemphasize that the study, the studies of vaccine safety don't end when they achieve um you know really the emergency use authorization they're ongoing so we're still monitoring for safety data and including at these oldest age groups the safety profile looks great um, the oldest age groups are one of the two populations that we've really been focused on vaccinating so far people who are um, living in nursing homes are by and large amongst our oldest, um, in our oldest age groups, and then of course people who work in, in healthcare settings. Um, so we have a lot of older people who've gotten it at this point, and, um, and we have no real concerns about the safety profile in those age groups. In the pre-release trial, the side effects in older people were actually less than in younger uh, people. That. Right. Um, and by side effects, I mean the normal like sore arm headache kind of thing. And I'll also say, you know, she's that you have to balance the risks of vaccine against the risks of, of getting COVID. And, um, and in spite of her health, you know, older people have weakened immune systems. That's a normal part of aging. And she's at very high risk of serious complications and even death if she were to get COVID, um, even as a healthy 84 year old. So I would strongly recommend that she get the vaccine as soon as she can. Agreed. Yeah. And oh, one more point I really wanted to emphasize, there is no way that this, the vaccines can give her COVID. Um, these mRNA vaccines contain no virus at all. And there is just no biological possibility that they could give her COVID. Yeah. No, that's really good to clear up because some yeah. people are worried about that. So I think that that is all we have time for today. Um, I yeah, had I one that. more question I re really wanted to take about the reactions to vaccines, but maybe we'll postpone that one for next time. Okay. Um, so I, we get a lot of questions in our question box. We cannot get to them all in our short time together, but I do read every one of those questions. We use them to decide what we're gonna post about for the next week. Um, we use them for next week's Q and A. So we really value those questions. 
Um, we got a lot of questions this week that already have answers. Um, wearing a mask after getting vaccinated, getting together with a group of people who've all been vaccinated, taking ibuprofen after getting the vaccine. We posted about that yesterday. So please go check out our website. Those questions all have answers waiting for you there. And the question box is also there. It's dearpandemic.org. So thanks for joining us. I'll be back at the same time next week, Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Central. And we are going to be joined by our resident nerdy immunologist, Dr. Michelle Kinder, which should be a really That's interesting awesome. discussion. You can get really science-y. I know. <laughs> we will, for sure. So until then, stay safe and stay sane. Thanks very much.